And welcome back, everybody, to DEF CON 28 Safe Mode, Blue Team Village. We're going to start our next uh, set of speakers. We've got a great topic coming up today. Uh, the title of this talk is Building Blue Spawn, an open source active defense and EDR software. Uh, Jake Smith and Jack McDowell will be presenting. As always, uh, please direct all questions to the Text Talks Track 1 uh, channel. Uh, or you can uh, connect to their Discord server as well and send messages to them directly. I'll have that in there in one second. And on that note, uh, over to you, Jake and Jack. All right. Thank you. Uh, so how's everyone doing today? Uh, just a few quick notes uh, before we get into the presentation. Um, we definitely want to take a moment to say thank you to all the volunteers and organizers of the Blue, Te Blue Team Village. Um, putting this uh, event on in a normal year is a lot of work, and I can only imagine um, what they've done to make this happen. So a huge thank you to them. Uh, so today, Jack and I are going to be uh, talking about an open source project we've been developing for about a year now. Uh, it's called BlueSpawn, and you'll notice the emphasis on active defense here. Uh, so we'll get into more about that later. Um, but first, a little bit of background about the two of us. Uh, we went to the University of Virginia. Um, both of us got our start in InfoSec doing um, really all kinds of cyber competitions, CTFs and whatnot. And that's been a fantastic way to kind of get into security. Um, and these competitions uh, we'll talk about more are some of the reasons why we created BlueSpawn uh, and all. So an important caveat uh, to before we get into the presentation, uh, when we say we this afternoon, uh, we're referring to all six of us on the slide. Uh, it turns out that developing a, a large open source project with already like 20,000 lines of C++ uh, is a huge, huge undertaking. Uh, so it's really a team effort uh, that we've been doing uh, to create this. Uh, so, uh, and also before we get into talking about BlueSpawn specifically, uh, we're going to do a brief overview uh, of some of the available tools out there and kind of where they shine, um, where they have some shortfalls and more. Um, and really, uh, this is just uh, all the tools that we're going to mention uh, do a fantastic job, which is part of the reason why uh, we want to talk about them as well. Um, so first, we'll start with your endpoint detection and response, or EDR tools. Um, that's your CrowdStrike, your Carbon Black, your Defender ATP, Sentinel-1 and all. Um, they obviously used to, uh, like 10, 15 years ago, AVs were pretty simple. They look for bad hashes and whatnot. Um, and now kind of that's, they've increased and they've gotten really, really good. So these commercial tools and they're a bit expensive in some ways, uh, but they really raised the bar uh, for finding the low hanging fruit, especially in some, even some of the more advanced malware. Uh, they're obviously not all created equal, but um, one of the things we noticed when we started developing BlueSpawn is that uh, these defensive security solutions are pretty opaque overall. They're, there's obviously a lot of offensive tools out there, but um, it's really hard to get your hands on and kind of understand how these modern AV and EDRs work. Um, which leads us into a bit about uh, some of the free tools that are out there. Um, there's not a whole lot of great ones, but uh, definitely system internals is probably one of the best. If you haven't used like Sysmon, if you haven't used much just beyond like Sysmon to improve your logging, um, highly recommend taking a look at like auto runs and process explorer and procmon um, just it, they, they do a great job of, of finding malware on the system um, they're more geared though toward the system analysis side so they don't really they're not going to say like hey this is malware they might show like a different color if this is uh, like encoded or something but um, they're not going to point out and like say this is miter attack technique 1547 right for example um, next is Process Hacker. Process Hacker is another really great tool. Uh, there's not much automation or security focus, uh, but it's really good at just analyzing. It's like task manager on steroids, really. Um, and you can even look at like a specific con uh, region in memory. Um, so like if you know that uh, one process uh, was injected, for example, then you could go and analyze each bit of the memory uh, yourself. And then on the like purely defensive side, uh, we've definitely found PE Civ to be one of the best and free and open source tools out there by far. Um, the idea is pretty simple behind the tool. It's basically look at all the processes running on the system, and then uh, it can find hooks, process hollowing, process injection, shellcode, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, 
The only downside, if it's really a downside, is that it's limited to scanning processes. So it's not going to find uh, like other malware, say, like that's hiding in the registry on a system. Um, and finally, uh, in this uh, kind of available tools section, um, is like the collections of Yara rules, Sigma rules, Syslon configs out there. Uh, even just a few years ago, there just wasn't really a whole lot out there, especially on the defensive side in way of signatures. Um, and But these projects are doing a really good job of starting to share threat intel a bit more widely um, and can help you find threats just on a particular system. Uh, the only thing, I, I guess the caveat is like with hardening with scripts, for example, a lot of the stuff you'll find out there is very, um, I guess, more script-like and not fully fleshed out. And so that's one thing to be aware of, like they'll set conflicting values or miss critical settings and whatnot. Um, but so that, I mean, that's uh, that's kind of the reasons why we got into building BlueSpawn, which we'll talk about here more shortly. Um, and one of the key things we want to emphasize this afternoon is that, um, is the ideas and principles on which we built this tool. You're probably not going to go into work Monday and deploy BlueSpawn in production. Um, and I guess you could, but that's maybe not something you want to do quite yet because um, the project's not quite that far along. Uh, but that said, you can use the information in today's talk to uh, to conduct your own security research and begin uh, kind of improving your own defenses too and looking at how these kinds of solutions work. Uh, so uh, with all things, uh, all great ideas, I guess, started in Slack and whatnot. So this was, I went into our archives, this was last year, like, we started with this really simple idea, like what if we could like scan one particular thing, like look at just registry run keys, like as a way to detect threats uh, and whatnot on a system and like an open source tool. And we didn't find a whole lot out there. Um, so that kind of uh, led us to to creating BlueSpawn. Um, and as I said, we were students or we are students. So we compete in a lot of these different cyber defense competitions and whatnot. Honestly, frankly, I tell some people that I just do go to school for competitions and all. Um, but uh, basically, these cyber defense competitions are uh, basically you get a network and you're asked to secure it against active attackers um, who, unfortunately for the students, are industry red team. So you can imagine how that kind of thing goes. Um, and the red team pretty much always wins. Uh, so in these competitions, though, we can't really we can't use commercial tools and we can't bring in scripts. So we have to rely on open source tools. So that's kind of another reason why we focus so heavily on the open source aspect. Um, and so we built BlueSpawn on one really uh, particular focus is that we want to be able to stop threats as quickly as possible. So think that you should be able to run this tool and find as many, if not the majority or, or more of all of the threat, all of the malware that's running on your system uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and so that is where the active defense idea of active defenses comes comes in. Um, and then the next is is coverage. So when doing these cyber defense competitions, it's it's time limited. You're stressed, you're stressed and whatnot. So you don't have the luxury of say being able to look at everything very closely, and you can't pull up a process explorer and look at every individual process to hunt for process injection. Um, so our idea is that if you can get 60, 70, 80 percent of the way there on finding the most common threats uh, and you know what your tool is going to be looking for, you can spend more time on those other areas uh, as well. And finally, open source software. So this is a call to everyone out there. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the, the offensive side, but there's just not really as much on the defensive side. So. Uh, definitely building more open source blue team software, I think is really important and is a great way for people uh, to learn uh, about how these kinds of things work and how you might detect, uh, say, one particular technique in the attack matrix. So as time went on uh, from that simple idea that we posted a while ago in Slack, um, we started moving BlueSpawn towards um, what you might term as call an EDR type solution uh, today. Um, so that's where it's doing continuously monitoring. Uh, and we're asking questions like, what if we could just deploy BlueSpawn across a whole network, like you might deploy like Falcon? Uh, this is kind of the, the ideas that we're heading towards as we spend more and more time developing this. And then also proactive defense. So like, it's not enough that you can detect uh, 
uh, malware and, and respond to it, right? We also, one of the core focuses is the idea of being able to prevent these uh, malicious activities in the first place. So we've talked a lot about active defense so far, but what do we really mean by it? And how does Blue Spawn approach the idea of finding anomalous or malicious behavior? And that's kind of what I'll get into in this section. So typical antivirus or EDR products are meant to kind of run in the background behind everything, only raising alerts and acting when there's something definitely bad going on. For their use cases, this is a very good thing. People don't want alerts about everything that may or may not be malicious. But when you've been compromised, or even when you think you've been compromised, that might not be enough. This is where I, our concept of active defense comes into play. Rather than sit in the background, only rarely making noise, BlueSpawn is meant to be a tool that's actively used. The goal is to find absolutely everything that could be malicious, not just the things it knows for sure are malicious. In such an approach, there are drawbacks. In catching all the things, we're sure to catch some things that aren't actually bad. But for an active defense situation, that's a trade-off we want to make. So how does BlueSpawn go about approaching this? Originally, this worked by just performing a scan of the system at a point in time to identify all the threats that were currently on there. And this hunting involved the typical registry scans, file scans, or process scans that an AV or EDR product would use. But again, BlueSpawn tried to be more in depth, taking more time to look at things with more of a focus on finding anything that's not normal. And I think part of what makes BlueSpawn different is we also factor event logs into our hunts. So correlating what Windows events have occurred with what is currently on the system to identify any sort of malicious behavior there. And we're trying to basically use that to bridge the gap between incident response and what EDR products do. And as we move towards continue, continuous monitoring, we extended these hunts to be able to run as needed. And I'll talk more about how we did that shortly. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, BlueSpawn is built pretty heavily around the idea of what we call hunts. For each MITRE attack technique we support, which is basically a way attackers do things if you're not familiar, we created a hunt, which basically is a search for any sort of evidence of malicious activity using the technique. We'll get into more detail about how specifically these hunts work in a bit, but for now, just know that they're really the starting point for everything BlueSpawn does. Monitoring, as I mentioned a while back, is really just an extension of the hunts we've already written. Each hunt creates triggers for when it should be rerun, and when those triggers occur, it gets run again. Now, MITRE recently released sub-techniques, which break down each technique attackers may use into subcategories, and BlueSpawn has just moved to handle that by making each hunt responsible for all of the sub-techniques that fall under it. So these hunts are really great for finding the starting points in malicious behavior. We can find registry keys that run files, files that run on startup libraries that aren't meant to be included at all, all sorts of fun stuff. But malware tends to have a number of different components that it uses, or even if it doesn't, it exists in multiple different forms in multiple different places. Maybe there's a registry key that points to a file, and then that file is loaded into a process, and then that process is changing other registry keys, and those keys point to files, and those files, well, you get the idea. To address this, BlueSpawn searches each piece of evidence it finds in order to see if it can catch anything related to it. The result from this is a network of evidence of malicious activity. In the next section, I'll go into a bit more detail about how this actually gets built. Now that I've given a higher level overview of our methodology, I'm going to take a deeper dive into the different things BlueSpawn can do with a focus on how it does them. And this section is going to get a little bit technical, but I'll, I'll finish it with a more broad overview if you don't catch anything. So before I get into any of the features, I want to preface with a disclaimer. BlueSpawn is still in alpha development. So far, we've been mostly focusing on infrastructure, that is building out the core of the features I'm getting into. Everything I'm presenting is currently implemented, but it's not entirely without its bugs. And the, biz the biggest example of what I'm talking about is our scanning subsystem. I'm going to say things like, this is where BlueSpawn scans X, but the actual scans performed are new and not necessarily heavily tested. At this point, I'd say a lot of the features described here are better talked about as a framework than a fully fresh fleshed out product. And none of this is to say BlueSpawn isn't effective. We spent a long time building our hunts and expanding our coverage, and it's proven to be pretty good at its job, as Jake will showcase in his case study section. And now that's out of the way, onto the features. 
BlueSpawn has five major components, each of which we'll discuss in detail in this section. There's Mitigate, which applies security settings, Hunt, which runs the hunts I was talking about earlier, Scan, which determines how bad detections really are and finds associations, Monitor, which hunts over time, and React, which handles responses to what hunt mode and scan mode have identified. So Mitigate mode sits somewhat apart from the rest of BlueSpawn without really any integrations to the other modes, so I'll just talk about that first to get out of the way. Uh, mitigations applied by BlueSpawn are all mapped to either a Security Technical Implementation Guide, or STIG, released by DISA, or the Minor Attack Mitigations Framework. When run in Mitigate mode, BlueSpawn can either audit the current state of the system, which just says this is what it's currently set up as, or it can go ahead and apply the mitigations it finds aren't properly configured, with user confirmation, of course. Now, as of now, our mitigation framework is very quite simple, we but we think it has a lot of potential as BlueSpawn continues to grow. We see it eventually being configurable through some sort of configuration file, so mitigations can be more uniformly and quickly applied across a network. We also see it mitigating services and software installed on a system rather than just the base operating system. And finally, our biggest envision change is for mitigation mode to serve as really an aid in performing a system audit. So this would perform some of the same tasks as enumeration tools such as Seatbelt or JAWS with a focus on finding and fixing things actually being vulnerable to being exploited. Now, before I get into the weeds of how everything works, I'm gonna throw some definitions at you for how I refer to the ideas and concepts uh, BlueSpawn uses. So I'm gonna be using the word detection a lot, and it's just that, a detection. It could be something good, it could be something bad, it's just something BlueSpawn identified is taking a closer look at. It could be like a file, a registry key, a process, or something else entirely. Next, there's an association, which is also just what it sounds like. It's a connection between two different detections, and in BlueSpawn, we represent associations as having a weight, representing how closely they are associated. Uh, next thing is certainty, and this is the metric we use for determining the likelihood that a detection is actually bad. There are three components to it, though two of them get combined, so in practice, there are really only two. The first is what I call intrinsic certainty. This is the certainty that comes from the detection itself. This would be what we're talking about if a service is called Mimikatz, or if a file matched a Yara rule from Interpreter, or something like that. The next is contextual certainty. This comes from the context surrounding, this, surrounding the detection. In a lot of ways, this is very much like the intrinsic certainty. And in fact, BlueSpawn doesn't actually differ differentiate between the two. They're really combined. And what I mean by context is th things like a file in System32 that's not signed by Microsoft. And that's probably bad just because they usually are. Or any value listed under an app in it DLLs is probably bad just because they aren't really used legitimately anymore. The last type of certainty I'm gonna talk about is associative certainty. And this is the certainty that comes from the associations of a detection. Say we've got a file and we found it loaded into a process. This, if the process is behaving maliciously and the file appears malicious, the, pro the file should be treated with a higher certainty than if all we had was a malicious looking file. Now that I've got those definitions out of the way, I can move on to how BlueSpawn actually works. The core of all detection management, and really the core of BlueSpawn itself, is our detection register. This tracks everything that BlueSpawn's found. Whenever a hunt or a scan or whatever finds anything that might be bad, it sends it to the detection register. The register will record the detection and send back a reference to it. Now, this reference may or may not be to the detection that was recorded, and I'll explain why next slide when I explain how the registration process actually works. The detection register has three storage mechanisms. So whenever a detection gets registered, it gets queued for a scan, and we track all queued detection in one set and all scanned detections in another. That way we can just make sure we're not re redoing the same work. We also keep a record of all detections regardless of whether or not they've been scanned. So now for how registration actually works. The first thing the register actually does when a new detection is being added is it checks if the detection already exists. If it does, they get merged together. And generally the only thing that changes when this happens is their contextual certainties and their context get merged. If this merge causes their overall certainty to exceed a certain threshold, it then gets logged and its reactions get triggered. 
if the detection being registered was merged to the pre-existing one, the reference that returned is actually to the pre-existing one. That way it's just keeping track of the, the detection that we care about. Otherwise it's to the new detection. After all of this is handled, if the detection register needs to queue scans for the detection, it will. This constitutes calculating the intrinsic certainty, identifying associated detections, and then if the certainty is high enough after that, logging it and handling reactions. The associated detections then get registered and the scans for those get queued and so on. So here I've got a diagram for how the detection register lays things out. It looks kind of complicated, but I'll try to explain it so it's maybe not quite as bad as it looks. So the register itself has three main storage mechanisms. There's the queue of things that haven't been scanned yet, things that have been scanned, and then everything overall. And you can see that all of these storage mechanisms really just store references to detections that are stored elsewhere. I've also broken down one detection, in this case ID2, to show what kind of information a detection actually holds. So at first it has its ID, which is just an ID, a unique identifier to refer to it. It has a context, which is the information surrounding how it was made and how it was found and when, it, when that happened and all that. So that'd be what time the detection occurred, what hunt found it, and when the first evidence of the detection was found. There's also the data, and this stores information about what actually did it find. So in this case, I've just decided for the purpose of an example, this detection is going to refer to a run key and its value is named. Its name persists and it's pointing to this file called bad.exe. The next thing I have is the scan information, which stores information about how it was scanned. So that has the certainty, which combines the intrinsic and the contextual certainties, and then the associative certainty. The last part of this is the associations, which identifies which detections are associated with this one. In this case, detection ID1, which I'm using to refer to as bad.exe, is associated with it. There's also a mediator, and I'll get to that a bit later. So in the methodology section, I mentioned how hunts represent the starting point for pretty much all the threat hunting that Boostbond does. And each one covers one MITRE attack technique. Each hunt we then break down into sub-techniques, which can be run independently of each other. Within each sub-technique, that gets broken down then into subsections. And one subsection generally checks just one specific attack surface, whether it's a folder, a file, an event ID, or a registry key, or something else. The idea is to keep it as simple and small as possible. This design allows for much more targeted hunts if we know what we're specifically we're looking for. And I'll get into why that matters when I talk about how monitoring works. Most of the things we check get a quick scan, which just performs the most elementary scans as a very quick test to determine whether or not something deserves more detailed scans. If it does, we create a detection for it and register it with the detection register and kick off the whole scanning thing I just finished talking about. Then the scans I discussed get run on it and make a determination, find out the related things, and so on. Here's an example of what a hunt looks like. In this case, this is a T1547. The hunt itself really just runs all sub-techniques underneath it, you can see here. The, um, and then here's the sub-technique number four, which I picked out because it was pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> the first part of it just compares the uh, win logon values for the shell and user init against known goods. If they don't match, we create a detection with a moderate contextual certainty because anything that doesn't match Chances are it's bad, even though the file itself might not be bad. The next subsection refers to the win logon notify values. Any of these that we find get a detection created for it just because they aren't used very commonly. And we create that with a weak contextual certainty because again, if you find one, the chances are it's not great. Now you'll notice during each of these, I specify cursory when I initialize a subsection. That comes from when you run blue spawn, you specify how closely it should be looking for things. There's cursory, which is a very quick check. There's intensive, which is very slow, but careful check. And then there's normal, which is somewhere in between. By specifying cursory here, we indicate that blue spawn should run these subsections whenever the intensity is greater or equal to the cursory. So when we originally had our first working version of blue spawn, it was just a few hunts we'd written and not too much else. Since then, everything we've done really has been taking what we had and proving it. When it came time to start monitoring systems in real time, rather than just performing a single scan, 
we realized we could reuse the hunts we had already written to do this. Each hunt we created already defines a number, sorry, each hunt we created defines a number of events that indicate something pertinent to the hunt has changed. For example, we might make an event watching a folder for new files or old files being edited. When the event gets triggered, hunts that care about that folder get rerun. Of course, there are some obvious inefficiencies in this, which is a big reason why we divided hunts into subsections. Now, when hunts create events, they specify which subsection should get run for each event. Now, I'll admit monitoring is unfortunately one of the areas that hasn't received as much attention as others. It's certainly functional, and it's effective at watching for things that hunts can catch, but so far we don't have that much that acts based off of behavior alone that we observe while monitoring. In the coming months, this is going to be one of our big focuses. Adding things like event tracing for Windows or API monitoring should position BlueSpawn to be able to catch much more. So here's an example of how monitoring sets up its, um, or Hunt sets up all of its monitoring triggers. So if you noticed my example hunt two slides back, each of these sub-techniques gets a scope passed into it. Well, under the hood, what's happening is the uh, subsection macros I have actually check the scope against that subsection ID to determine whether or not that subsection should be run. So whenever I create an event here, I specify which subsections are pertinent to it. And <clears throat> Yeah, so here we have registry events, file, and file events, but we also have event log events to watch for Windows events being created. So the last component I'm going to talk about here is the reaction framework. As the name would imply, this is responsible for taking care of detections that BlueSpawn has determined are bad. Since BlueSpawn is designed around finding as much as possible and is bound to have some false positives, most things here requires some sort of level of user confirmation before taking action. Now, obviously, when I delete a file, it's no longer an active threat, but there's still a reason for BlueSpawn to track it. To handle this sort of detection, each detection, sorry, to handle this sort of situation, each detection has a flag where we mark it as stale or not. Whenever a detection, sorry, whenever a reaction mitigates a detection, we mark it as stale, so that way other reactions don't go and try to mitigate it their way. Currently, we have five reactions available, though there is somewhat of a less defined sixth, and I'll get into that. Uh, BlueSpawn can delete files, quarantine files, delete registry entries, and that can be values or keys, suspend processes, or carve out memory. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. The less defined reaction I just mentioned is for special cases. Remember back to the win logon hunt where it was comparing some values against known goods? It wouldn't be very good to just delete these values if they were malicious. They need to be properly restored. And to handle things like that, when a detection is created, it can be given a customer mediator. This remediator gets precedence over all other uh, reactions if it's present. Now, as we continue to develop BlueSpawn, we of course intend to con continue adding reactions and improving the ones we do have. Future reactions might include things like deregistering service or blocking certain commands. So I promised that I'd get into war what I meant by memory carving, so here we are. The idea behind memory carving is that sometimes libraries or shellcode get shoved into processes, and these processes still serve a valid purpose and need to remain active. In cases like these, where a restart isn't a good solution, we came up with a way to mitigate the effect of whatever malicious library or shellcode is living inside a process. It's not perfect, and it can cause problems, but it's better than nothing. The first, uh, this reaction works in five steps. First, we suspend the process so that nothing we're doing uh, causes problems with the way the process works. First, what we do is we enumerate the threads in the process, searching for any thread whose stack overlaps the memory section in question. And that basically is an indicator that the thread is acting based off of what that malicious memory section wants it to do. If or when we find this, we kill any thread that does that. Since malware generally doesn't like to share with something, share a thread with something benign, it shouldn't kill anything important to the process. Of course, if you got things like APC injection going on, there's not too much we can do about that right now. After that, we scan all of memory for pointers to the memory segment in question. If or when we find them, we check the address in question. If it's data, we patch it with zero, so it can't read anything important there. If it's code, we patch it with return instruction, so if it ever tries to call there or jump there, it gets immediately bounced right back. Then we go through and patch the entry point and all functions that are exported with return return instructions, so anything trying to run any function inside the memory gets messed up. 
This can cause problems if we end up patching any function that requires the call lead to clean up the stack, but without extensive work to figure out how much the stack needs to be cleaned up, there's not too much we can do. Once we're done with all that, we resume the process and let things continue. We have tested this with a couple different pieces of malware, including Cobalt Strike Beacons and Reterpreter, and it seems to work without causing too many problems. Unless processes are storing function pointers in an abnormal manner, it should be very difficult to get anything in this memory segment working again after what we do occurs. Now, we are working on a few features to improve the stability of this. This includes things like forcibly walking threads back instead of just killing them, or finding out how much the stack needs to be cleaned up when patching returns, or properly unloading libraries as seen in Process Hacker rather than just breaking them. Now, BlueSpawn would have been nearly impossible to build from the ground up without any libraries or integration. As has been a major theme in our presentation, the MITRE attack framework has been invaluable in providing guidance around what sort of things we should go for. Yara and Yara rules written by the community have provided immense value in being able to scan files and make determinations. The stigs around which we built our mitigations make it very clear what we should prioritize and give us a framework to convey our coverage. Finally, PESIV is a great open source tool we use to scan any process for any sort of fileless execution or any, store, any form of execution that's not properly mapped to a file. In summary, BlueSpawn's abilities can be broken into three categories, prevention, detection, and response. Under prevention, we have mitigate mode, which integrates STIGs and MITRE's attack framework. Under detection, we've got monitor mode, which watches for changes to rerun hunts, hunt mode, which is built around the MITRE attack framework, and then checks these threats. Scan mode then analyzes what was found in hunt mode to find associations and make determinations. And finally, under response, we have our reactions, which aim to mitigate or remove a threat and then logging to record what was found. All right, so that was, that was a lot, but we wanted to really give you uh, a deep insight into kind of how some of these AV and EDR type uh, programs, and obviously BlueSpawn in particular work. Um, and so now we're going to move into uh, talking about just like seeing the seeing the tool in action, right? Um, so we're going to walk through a case study uh, with some kind of specific point in time screenshots of BlueSpawn uh, catching malware, uh, and then also we're going to have a video of kind of the tool in action. Um, and I mentioned uh, cyber defense competitions have been a really important uh, learning tool at the beginning. So first, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, again. Um, the largest is probably CCDC, um, and it's held in about 10 regions across the U.S. with qualifiers, regionals, and nationals, and about 230 uh, universities compete each year, actually. So that's uh, one way, if you're looking to volunteer to help uh, in the community, highly recommend uh, looking into a competition like that um, or others. Um, so these competitions are basically what's known as an inherit and defend competition. Um, the student teams work in a group of eight, and they're basically work as a fictional company. So, like, they have a whole set of networks they have to defend, and typically that's on-prem. Um, there's some cloud aspects, and that's usually done in, like, ESXi um, or AWS. Uh, so here you can see um, an example of a network map from actually last year. So you have some on-prem workstations. Um, there's, like, an a on-prem cloud, if you will, in, like, ESXi. And then there's even like an AWS component. And you'll see the stuff in there ranges from Windows Server 2008, so like really old stuff, to, to Windows Server 2019 and every flavor of Linux distro, really. Um, so that's, they kind of emulate a modern, modern corporate environment the best they can. And there's, of course, stuff like Exchange and web apps and databases and all. And so basically, there's two goals in these competitions. You have to keep your services online. Um, and then just like you would in a real company, and then uh, you have to stop the red team from really just totally destroying uh, everything. Um, and really, frankly, that ends up in situations like this. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, this is uh, from the national competition this year, and it's where uh, a picture of the red team's cobalt strike instance, uh, where you can see they just have pwned dozens of machines uh, against this poor team. Um, and they also do things like uh, defacing the websites and RMing our, RMRFing uh, boxes or overwriting MBRs uh, when they get too much access. Um, but really, uh, what that means is that in all, in all reality is that these are a great testing ground uh, for defensive tools, right? So the red team spends all year writing malware for these competitions uh, and are probably watching right now. So hi, red team. Um, 
but so their tool set uh, is everything from like Metasploit and Cobalt Strike, uh, what's pretty commonly used, uh, to really custom malware that's just written for the purposes of CCDC. Uh, so with that kind of backstop in mind, we're going to look at um, some example screenshots of BlueSpawn. So here uh, we just have the system. Um, there's two Cobalt Strike beacons running. Um, one is a, just an HTTP beacon, and then the other is an SMB beacon living in explorer.exe. And so this is how BlueSpawn goes about finding it. Um, it's looking at when Jack talked about process injection earlier and the, the car memory reaction. Um, you can see BlueSpawn's finding, finding the malware in both explorer.exe and then also in the PowerShell uh, that's running. And then it starts prompting the user like, hey, we found this malicious activity and all they did, all the user did was just run BlueSpawn. Um, and then it's offering to kill the threads. And once it kills it, uh, then we reach a situation like this where those beacons basically just stop uh, calling back in. So that's, that's an example of how BlueSpawn is responding uh, to the threat. And here's another classic threat. Uh, it's not used, obviously, as much now, but um, the sticky keys backdoor is where the registry key is configured um, with command prompt as a debugger. So BlueSpawn's able to look for that, and that's T1546 uh, subtechnique 8, if you're following along uh, on the MITRE attack matrix, right? So it knows to look for that, and then it goes and finds it, and it lets you remove that option. Next, uh, this was probably one of the coolest examples we saw at a cyber defense competition that BlueSpawn caught earlier this year. Um, Windows has these things called authentication packages and notification packages. Um, and these exist in like the LSA subsystem, which is used for authentication and all. Um, so BlueSpawn is able to map and is like, hey, we found a registry key and it knows, it understands that in the hunt, that this uh, hunt refers to things on disk. Uh, so then it goes and correlates that with the file associated with it. So we have two detections, one for the file and one for the registry key that contains the badness. Um, next here is a, the good old run key. Uh, so this is, there's a malicious BBS script that's configured to run in the registry. Um, and it, again, BlueSpawn is able to correlate the two uh, and be able to connect that to generate detections uh, and find both pieces of malware. Um, here's a web shell. This is a great, uh, I like to use this for showing how the context works. So BlueSpawn uh, uses a combination of regexes and YAR rules, and it's scanning all the stuff on the, on the system in the web accessible directories uh, in say like IIS for PHP files. And it's able to say like, oh, this was caught by this YAR rule. This, this piece of, uh, this file probably contains a web shell. Um, and the next here is uh, a pretty simple example with like backdooring services. So attackers like to do this, of course, to get their malware uh, to persist. Um, and they can do this in a lot of ways. And so this is just a very simple example. Um, but BlueSpawn will scan all the services on the system to find right uh, which might contain a piece of malware uh, or what service is suspicious. So we want to get some feedback on Red Team, of course, uh, when we made this tool. And this was actually probably one of the first years they've ever had to contend with uh, an open source tool being built by one of the teams. Um, no one's really done that before just because it's a lot of work. And um, if other teams are using it, then right, maybe you're not getting quite as much value out, out of it. Um, but uh, I think it worked out really well. Um, and as you'd expect, our red teams uh, spend a lot of time analyzing the tool since it's open source. So the attackers know exactly what it can detect on, um, which is, it's a bit hard to, when you think about it, you're like, ah, oh, I don't know if I want the red team seeing it. Um, but what we found is that the, it really pushed the attackers to move to new techniques. So they couldn't just rely on the same things over and over again, because they knew we were going to catch that. So it forces them to keep moving and shifting their tactics. Um, which means they might uh, be less detectable, but it also really increases uh, the barrier uh, to make it harder for them. And uh, honestly, uh, one of the coolest parts is that the Red Team uh, unveiled something called Red Spawn um, this year. So that was a tool that was apparently supposed to like attack and defeat Blue Spawn. Um, so that feels like a, a validation uh, to us for sure that uh, Blue Spawn is effectively killing stuff uh, that they used to rely on. Uh, so from the blue team perspective, uh, what we found in our experiences and, and other teams and all is that BlueSpawn works uh, kind of like an EDR product uh, that you'd expect to. 
So you can identify, it'll identify and respond to malware on the system. Uh, one of the cool things we found is that it's like a force multiplier, especially in these active defense situations. So imagine if your tools deployed out uh, across the multiple systems, right? You don't have to manually look through all like the auto runs yourself. It'll just flag which ones are most likely to be suspicious. And that way you can spend more of your efforts hunting where it counts um, to find the malware. Um, and so that's really important. So we've prepared a little demonstration of what BlueSpawn looks like in action and how it can be actually used to hunt and then destroy malware. So I prepared a Windows Server 2012 R2 VM here, and I filled it up with a bunch of different random pieces of malware and persistence. So you can see here that I've got two active interpreter sessions on it, and I'm going to use BlueSpawn to go hunt and destroy them, among other things. So first I'll show you Wispo on top menu just so you can see all the options it has. And that's a pretty simple interface. Um, <clears throat> because I want to go find bad things, I'm going to run it in hunt mode. Uh, I'm going to specify a normal aggressiveness just because I don't need to go too in-depth to find anything. When I find stuff, I want to react by deleting files. So I use the delete file reaction. I want to remove values, so remove value reaction, and carve memory. And then I went to log to a file so I can view it later. And then the console so I can see it now. I just press enter and now it runs. That's pretty much all there is to getting it to run. So here it found a process injection into uh, SVC host PID 632. And I'll open it up in a process hacker. So you can see here that it actually tells me the memory address where it found the injection. So I can, I can actually go take a look at that in process hacker. And you'll see here that it's uh, RWX memory section, which generally is not a great thing. So I'll go ahead and carve that out. And here it found a couple more. So I'll go ahead and carve those out too. And here it found some process injection into winstartup.exe. And so I'll go ahead and carve those out. And now here it found the sticky keys backdoor that Jake was talking about earlier, the image file execution options debugger. And so I'll open that up in auto runs so you can see that it's also found by auto runs. And it's under the image hijacks tab. Sometimes everything doesn't show it. So you can see it there and there. I'll go ahead and remove that. And here it found the a run key that was running the um, process we found some injection in earlier, the Windows startup actions, which definitely is not legitimate. So go ahead and remove that run key. Uh, here it found a NetSH helper DLL, which is a sneakier persistence technique. You can see it in regedit. And BlueSpawn actually protects the files during scans. So this actually won't be able to show the signatures on it, but I, I assure you it's not good. So we'll go ahead and remove that uh, value there. And now it found the PHP web shell that we can go ahead and remove. And here is the uh, malicious service. So go ahead and remove that. Now for some reason, auto runs can't find it, but I'll show you in this command prompt that it absolutely is there. So I'll go ahead and remove that with BlueSpawn. And now I'll go ahead and remove the NetSH helper DOL file. And here's the WinStar up at EXE that it didn't like. And here's the malicious service. And that's it. That's all you have to do. And here's Auto Run showing you that stuff it found has been now cleared out. Let's go to the next slide. So here's what happened to the interpreter sessions that I had open. They got, they got killed when I carved out the memory. And now onto the feature work. BlueSpawn still has a long way to go with a lot more features to be added. I'm gonna talk here about some of the ideas and plans to come up with for feature development on BlueSpawn. So most of our goals right now fall under three categories, uh, improving coverage, improving configurability, and improving integrity. So under coverage, we plan to continue adding new hunts and mitigations. 
arguably our biggest goal here is to expand our data sources. So this would constitute things like API monitoring through a DLL load into all the processes or a kernel driver, uh, network traffic monitoring, user auditing, that sort of thing. We've also placed a large focus on improving our scanning capabilities. Admittedly, they are somewhat lacking right now using only the very basic metrics. One of our goals of BlueSpawn from the start has been to kind of bridge the gap between incident response and active defense, taking past incidents into account for current threat hunting. Currently, BlueSpawn has taken some smaller steps towards integration between the two, but we intend to work on building that up further and making it really a much bigger feature. As we develop BlueSpawn, we built most of our features to be very configurable from an API perspective. But as of now, BlueSpawn doesn't really do a good job of exposing those APIs. And the command line interface we have barely taps into the surface of that. We'd really like to expose more of these configurations to allow things like much more targeted hunts, customizable scanning, and mitigation presets. Uh, we'd also like to add a way for signatures and definitions to be configurable so that if users have their own signature base they'd like to integrate, they'd be able to. As for integrity, right now, BlueSpawn has very little defenses against malware or malicious users actually tampering with it. To that end, we intend to work on hardening BlueSpawn itself, making it much more difficult for a malicious process from modifying it or, inter or causing problems with its execution. And this would most likely be through a kernel driver. BlueSpawn also assumes it has all the rights that an admin normally has. But if malware is trying to protect itself, it might restrict access to certain resources that BlueSpawn was assuming it'd just get with no problem. This also would likely be addressed to the same kernel driver. Uh, finally, and this is more of a development feature, we intend to set up detailed atomic red team tests, which are basically tests that test against one specific uh, malware technique to ensure that each build has proper coverage for everything it should. Now, everything I've presented so far has been focused on our uh, Windows client. But our plans go a lot beyond that. Just this past week, actually, we finished porting a version of BlueSpawn over to Linux, where we are now able to write hunts and mitigations. The Linux client is, an, is a decent bit behind the Windows one in terms of capabilities and coverage, but we plan to have an initial release at some point soon. We've also begun developing a server used to deploy BlueSpawn across the network and then aggregate the logs and manage the client at scale. This server is still in its early stages, but we plan to ramp up development in the next few months. Finally, the last major component to BlueSpawn is the cloud. Now, this is a long way off, and I'll admit we haven't even started thinking about developing it yet. But the idea is that the clients or servers could send off malware to the cloud to perform better, more detailed scans, likely doing some form of sandboxing or, or heuristic analysis. This could also serve as a threat intelligence repository, sending out IOCs to clients and servers. So uh, we've talked a lot. Uh, hopefully we've given you a really good overview of kind of at a high level, like why we built BlueSpawn, uh, a bit really into the weeds of how it works and how these types of solutions really work in the real world. Um, and then kind of showing you uh, what it's like in action, right? Uh, so we're gonna conclude. Um, first, remember that BlueSpawn is very much still in the, act, uh, the alpha stage. Um, so it can detect a lot of the most popular techniques, but there's certainly some things that it's gonna miss and it's a bit rough around some of the edges. Um, since all the code uh, and detections are open source, though, we highly recommend uh, you taking it out, uh, just going to the GitHub page, and you can kind of find and look through, uh, see exactly how it works. And because it's really important to us to shed light on kind of how these black box uh, EDR uh, solutions that you might have deployed out in your network might actually work. Um, and we also want to extend a huge thank you again to the community projects uh, that are listed here. Um, really building something like this is not possible without these frameworks uh, and libraries. So uh, definitely check those two out as well. Um, so most importantly, if you've gained anything from this talk, uh, we'd, walk, we'd like you to walk away with these three things. Um, first, uh, using MITRE ATT&CK uh, to be able to detect threats and think about your defenses um, is a great springboard. And really think about it as a springboard. So like we found when we were developing at BlueSpawn that MITRE ATT&CK might not have the most in-depth information on a particular technique, right? Um, but you can use that and go as a rabbit hole. So if you know attackers are gonna abuse it, you can go look into that technique more to figure out how attackers might use it. Um, so that's a good, good, really good place to start. Um, second, knowing your coverage. Um, so we've used this more times than I can count, right? In our cyber defense uh, competitions and all. And it translates really good to the real world, right? So if you start thinking about like if you're Xing techniques off of the attack matrix, right? 
uh, you can actually get pretty far because if you think about it, the attacker isn't going to be able to uh, use those techniques as well against you once you've got a, got a little X over them. Um, so that's a, a great way uh, to think about defense. And then finally, um, really Blue Spawn is kind of like an, a massive experiment just to figure out and understand how modern day defensive software works. So just like you might tear apart uh, like exploits and malware, uh, we recommend doing the same thing for your defensive security solutions, right? And thinking about uh, learning about how they work and then you can use that uh, to kind of build and improve your own defenses. So uh, just a few housekeeping items, uh, I guess, before we wrap up. Uh, thank you all for listening today. Uh, we hope you've had as much fun as we have uh, in creating this and talking this afternoon. Um, we also would like to thank the, the conference volunteers, right? This would not have been possible without uh, all of their hard work and setting up the streaming um, and just making it all flow. Um, finally, uh, we've linked the slides on the README. We'll have the, the DEF CON release, if you will, go live here in a bit after this talk ends, so you can download the tool as we've been talking about it um, and kind of see a bit more what it's like. Uh, you can look at the slides. We also have a Discord for the project, so if you have any questions, and I think uh, they're going to post a link to the Discord and all, um, hop in there and you can go uh, chat with us afterwards and uh, we'll let you know. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So thanks again, guys, uh, for listening. We hope you really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Jake and Jack. That was a great talk. Uh, look forward to see what uh, Blue Spawn uh, continues to develop into. And we appreciate you coming out to DEF CON and uh, presenting to us. As a reminder, uh, as they've got up here on the slide, the Discord channel uh, takes you over to their server. It is also up in the general. Uh, under the general tab of our Discord channel, as well as a link in the actual text talk channel as well. Uh, other than that, have a great day, guys.